One of, probably one of my earliest memories is uh, still a very vivid one. I was three years old, maybe not even a few months past three, and my brother was still a little, little baby, maybe only uh, six or nine months old, and we were at a car show. Now, for this uh, for my family, this is a, a pretty normal thing. A car show is where, in case you're not aware, people with old cars or certain types of cars, and usually in the case of my father, it was old cars, uh, would get together and uh, show, show their cars, and people would come, and you would walk up and down long aisles looking at cars. And that was something that... Uh, you know, I, I was pretty accustomed to already. I understood the concept. And I was with Daddy looking at the shiny, beautiful cars. And then, well, Mom thought that I stayed with Daddy. And Daddy thought that I went with Mom to go sit down in the shade and feed Brent. And I did neither of those things. And at some point later, when I discovered this, I have no idea how long it had been, I probably got distracted by something shiny. And I realized that I looked around and I did not recognize any of the knees there. And I couldn't find my parents. And I had no idea where I was or what to do about any of this. I was on the verge of panic when I wandered about and happened upon two people that, I don't know, in my three-year-old brain looked like grandparents, so they must be trustworthy. And thank God they were, because they asked me if I was lost, and I told them I was, and they got me to the event organizers who had a loudspeaker and made an announcement that someone had lost their parents, and they came and got me. The fact that that memory, not the memory of people having told me that story, but that memory itself is still with me some 40 years later tells you how strong that was, that emotion of feeling lost and alone and terrified. Has anybody else ever had a moment when you were lost or alone? get left by parents somewhere. I think many of us have some story that we can identify with that, that feeling of being all alone and scared. And I think one of the things that that tells us, the fact that we humans tend to all know what this feeling is, that we have this feeling, it goes back to the fact that we were created to be in relationship with other humans. We were made to live together, to do life together. We were not made to be alone. And we can see that if we go back to uh, near the beginning of the Bible, if we go to Genesis chapter 2, the second of the, the two creation stories we find there, God has made this beautiful earth and sky and plants and all of these wonderful things. And then from the dirt of the earth, God forms a human being, a person. 
We, we actually miss this a little bit in Hebrew because it's got a really fun wordplay. It says that from the, the soil, the, the dirt of the earth, which in Hebrew, in Hebrew is Adama, God formed an Adam, a human, a person. And that is where we get the name Adam today. But it comes from that, that story of God creating and the, the way that God created from the earth an earthling. And then we read on. Then the Lord God said, It's not good that the human is alone. I will make him a helper that is perfect for him. So the Lord God formed from the fertile land all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky and brought them to the human to see what he would name them. The human gave each living being its name. The human named all the livestock, all the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But a helper perfect for him was nowhere to be found. So the Lord God put the human into a deep and heavy sleep and took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh over it. With the rib taken from the human, the Lord God fashioned a woman and brought her to the human being. And the human said, this one finally is bone from my bones and flesh from my flesh. She will be called a woman because from a man she was taken. And here's another thing that we don't get in English because the, the, the Hebrew, you know, is different here. Up until this point, the version that I've been reading from, the Common English Bible, refers to this being as just the human, the human. And it isn't until this this human, the Adam, is put in a deep sleep and God forms another human that the words change. And she will be called woman, which is in Hebrew, Isha, because from a man, Ish, she was taken. So what that shows us is that we were created to be in relationship. We, we were created for community. Now, I want to tell you a couple of disclaimers, some notes about what this does not say. This does not tell us that there's something wrong with single people or people who have not gotten married or that they are half of a person. It doesn't say that. This says we were created to be in relationships. And this is a descriptive story, the kind of story that comes about when you go, how did we get to be? And then we hear. This is not a prescriptive story or a story that says, and thus everyone shall go and do likewise. This is a story that tells us that we were meant for other humans, that humans need humans. We were meant to be together. It also doesn't say that women are to be helpers or somehow inferior to men. That's not a good reading of the Hebrew because the word that the 
Common English Bible translates into a helper perfect for him is actually the word azer. And the other times that that word is used, it is used to describe God. So it certainly does not mean that that is inferior, being a helper. This means a just right one, a co-worker. So let us hear what the Spirit has to say to us today. Loneliness, like fear that we have been talking about in this series, is a normal human emotion. It is a normal part of life. It just happens. And like fear, it isn't in and of itself a bad thing. It is just a part of being human the need to be with other humans. And yet, like fear, sometimes loneliness can, well, accumulate or snowball and, and become a problem. A study out of Great Britain uh, several years back demonstrated that chronic loneliness, a loneliness that doesn't just come and go, but a condition that persists, that chronic loneliness can have the same negative effects on your health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. We were made to be in relationship in community. And sometimes uh, we feel these periods of loneliness, but I for one can tell you that loneliness does not depend solely on there being another human beside you. Have you ever been in a room full of people and felt all alone? Loneliness is about more than just the presence of another. Loneliness is about that feeling that we are separated, that we are somehow distant or isolated or, well, it spins quite easily into unwanted and unloved and all by ourselves. That's what happens, and, and unfortunately, people who fear loneliness tend to interpret social interactions in the most negative way possible. An example that Adam Hamilton gives in his book. He describes that when he was in college, one of his jobs was a shoe, a shoe salesman at a department store. And, you know, it was kind of a, a nice department store, an upper-end department store, and they sold pretty expensive women's shoes. And one day, there was a couple there in the store who were looking at the samples and looking over what, what they had. And so, as he was supposed to do, he approached them, but he came up from behind them and he said, may I help you? And they didn't, didn't respond, didn't turn around. Well, he said, well, excuse me, um, my name's Adam. I, how can I help you? Nothing. No response. A third time, he said, uh, excuse me, uh, can I help you find something that you're looking for? Nothing. No reaction at all. He admits that in his mind, he immediately went to, well, 
These must be snooty rich people that think they're too good to talk to a little old shoe salesman. They're, they think they're better than me. He interpreted that event in a very negative way. And then they turned around, and as soon as they turned, he realized they were communicating to each other in sign language. They were not ignoring him or being snooty. They couldn't hear. And yet, we tend to do that. We, we tend to interpret things in a negative way. And often what happens is it becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy. People who are lonely and who start to get overwhelmed and overcome by that fear of loneliness do the opposite of the things that would help them not be lonely. They tend to withdraw. They tend to assume the worst of others' intentions and isolate themselves from others. This, again, is a, it's a normal human tendency. So what do we do about it? Well, as we've been talking about in this series, there are some different techniques that we can use. And one from the uh, therapeutic community is called intentional re-engagement. And this is when we catch ourselves isolating and not um, feeling in community, sometimes we need to, to force ourselves to go out and get involved, to do something with other people. A survey done by the AARP showed that people who reported that they were involved in their church or synagogue or mosque were 40% less likely to report chronic loneliness. So when we get out there and get involved, volunteer, do things for others, it often helps us get out of that cycle of loneliness, helps us refocus our, our attention on others, and can help us to be less lonely. And there are several things that our faith has to say about this. A uh, fourth century theologian, St. Augustine, has a famous saying where he said, Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. See, we were made not only for relationship with other humans, but we were also made to be in relationship with God. We were created to be loved by God. One of the ways we know this promise comes to us in Psalm 139. I'll read just a few of the verses. You surround me front and back, you put your hand on me. Where could I go to get away from your spirit? Where could I go to escape your presence? If I went up to heaven, you would be there. If I went down to the grave, you would be there too. If I could fly on the wings of dawn, stopping only to rest on the far side 
of the ocean. Even there, your hand would guide me. Even there, your strong hand would hold me tight. Thanks be to God. God is always with us. We are never alone. When we uh, sometimes, hopefully, we have some good friends. Maybe they're blood-related, maybe not. But they're those stretcher bearers. Like I was telling the story to the children earlier, friends who will come no matter what, no matter when. Adam Hamilton calls those stretcher bearer friends. Those people who will do anything for you at any time, at any cost to themselves. Those stretcher bearer friends can help us get through those, those times of loneliness. And the old adage comes into play here. If you don't have any of those, or if you wonder, uh, how do I get friends like that? The only one to have one is to be one. The only way to have one is to be one. So when we are stretcher bearers for others, we often find we have those friends in return. So between those, between friends that we can cultivate that that are stretcher bearer friends and the knowledge that even if we had no stretcher bearer friends, even if we were physically alone, God is never far. Adam Hamilton says, we were given a wonderful imagination and we can choose how to use it. Sometimes we choose to use our imaginations in ways that, that we can envision horrible scenarios where we die alone and friendless, surrounded by 157 cats, or we can use that same imagination, that same power, to lean into the trust that God is with us. We are never alone. That no matter where we go, we could not get somewhere that God could not find us and hold us. That God is as near as our next breath. We are never alone. So I agree We can use our imagination in different ways toward different ends. And if we harness that power, we can. We can harness that power to envision, to remind us when we are in a bad place or a bad time that we are not alone, we are not friendless, that we always have God as near as our next breath. People who are involved in churches tend to have 
more stretcher bearer friends than those who are not. That's a, a fact that we found in several studies. Church is a natural place that forms stretcher bearer friends and that helps us extend that grace to everyone. The church is meant for us because we were meant to be in community. And so if you are not a part of our community yet, and you are feeling a nudge this morning, I encourage you to lean into that. And we would invite you to join with us. Because we know that when people come and become part of our faith community, we are more the people that God has called us to be. We grow better each time we welcome others. And so we uh, would love to extend that invitation to you. We do not claim to be perfect or to have all the answers, but we are committed to working it out together. And so if you would like to make that decision this morning, whether it's to join with our family of faith, whether it's perhaps to share your faith and, and accept Jesus Christ for the first time, or whatever decision, wherever you are in your faith journey. If you'd like to make that this morning, you can share it with me now. You can come down as we sing our final song and let me know. Or if you would like a little bit more time and you'd like to talk to me about it, please get in touch with me, and I would love to visit with you sometime this week. So, I invite you as you feel led, would you please stand and join us as we sing our hymn of commitment. One of my favorites, Be Thou My Vision. for being with us this morning. Thank you for making it a, a priority to join us in worship and begin your week with us. We thank you for giving that time to us and pray that it has been meaningful to you. 
So now I hope that you have a wonderful week and that as you go, you remember there is no step you can take that God has not already been there. God is as near as your next breath. Go in that peace and share it with others.